All right, looks like we're in place. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to say, say thank you first off for taking the time to come out and listen to our second seminar of the five part series. Uh, for those that are not familiar, if this is your first time tuning in, we have a five part series for hazards. So it'll be specific to seasonal, uh, the summer emergencies, and we will cover in the series uh, each season. So we've already covered spring. This is our summer series. We're going to offer this also in Spanish next week, this time, this location, or excuse me, Robert Crowd Center. And we will then have a fall and a winter series. Additionally, we have a financial preparedness that will be offered uh, January of next year. So that should cover more or less the hazards that are specific to Evanston and We've tried to tailor the messaging because there's a number of hazards, natural hazards that you can experience. We are trying to make sure that the information you have is most relevant to your needs. My name is Kimberly Cool. I'm the Division Chief of Emergency Management, Logistics, and our Public Information Officer for the City of Evanston. I've been with Evanston for, I'm in my 23rd year nearly. And I've been in the fire service for about 20, I'm in my 26th year. During my time in office, I was recently appointed about three years ago to this, this position as emergency manager. And I have had the pleasure of getting to know the community. I have also understood that we have needs relevant to our area that I'm learning about on a daily basis. I'm gonna introduce Mario Tristan, who's gonna come up and introduce uh, you to what he does relative to the organization Evanston Fire Department. Good evening, my name is Mario Tristan. I am the fire plan reviewer for the city of Evanston. I work in the fire prevention division. Uh, my primary job is plan reviews for any new or remodel constructions going on in Evanston. I have been with Evanston for the past nine years. I've been in the fire service for over 40 years. Uh, seven municipalities I've worked in. Uh, I work with Chief Cool in the emergency preparedness. Uh, we go hand in hand with fire prevention. I deal with a lot of the codes the life safety requirements, and together uh, we, uh, we, we we're um, completing this presentation. Thank you. Katie Jacob is our representative from the public library. She has been the mastermind behind setting this whole operation up. So we just would like to thank her for her time and effort in getting this ready. She is elected to work the computer. So uh, we're gonna then go to the American Red Cross. We have Brian Nessler. Yep. And Sarah Davis. Um, a quick introduction of myself. My name is Sarah Davis. I'm with the American Red Cross. I've been with them for about four years now. I have, um, regarding disasters, I've been to six hurricanes, one typhoon, and more fires than I can count at this point, assisting people that have been through those disasters. Um, I love doing what I do because I love helping people. I wish disasters didn't happen because most of those home fires are preventable. And hopefully we can talk about that a little bit later. And my name is Brian Nessler. I'm the regional disaster response manager for the state of Illinois. So uh, I also do quite a bit with uh, response and uh, recovery. Know a lot about that, have probably been more fires than you have. <laughs> so uh, so between the two of us, we, we definitely you know see a lot of what happens after the fact. We're looking forward to sharing you with you kind of what we do with the Red Cross and, and how that works. So. so as you can see, we have a wealth of experience in this room alone. Uh, there will certainly be an opportunity for questions. Based on the format of this discussion, we will limit the questions to the end of the presentation. Again, this is relatively new to us and we have a lot of material to cover. We tried to streamline our presentation to better accommodate the time frame that we're working within. However, if we do run over, we'll be able to take those questions and answer them either electronically, if you would like to post them, we can answer them at the end of the seminar or just answer any questions uh, in person here. So we're gonna cover the, most four, the four most relevant hazards. This is based off of lots of survey data, obviously any historical data that we've had relative to our region and uh, what we've called the CARP, which is a Community Action Resilience Plan, which talks about climatological assessments for our area. And there are trends based on climate change, which we'll 
cover in a very high level overview why that's relevant to us, why those hazards aren't going away anytime soon, and how we need to prepare. A couple of quick facts. A lot of times you'll hear about climate change, some of which people confuse with being natural, and just, that's just what we're experiencing. There is unrefutable data that that, in fact, is not the case. There's natural trends, which I'll show you here momentarily, that talks about the trends over the last 800,000 years. And then we can see directly related since 1950 to present what those impacts are based on use of fossil fuels, agriculture, vehicles, emissions, industry, and so forth. The earth is warming. Uh, clearly we have over a one degree increase uh, and the trends are not promising. Shrinking ice sheets certainly has led to obviously a raise in the, the water level. We have the warming oceans, rising sea levels. Again, that CARP, that Community Action Resilience Plan, in 2017, the Evanston, city of Evanston had received grants, uh, grant dollars to help support a local study. And flooding, heat waves, and windstorm or surge activity is the three most notable trends. So that's what we're gonna focus primarily on today. We will talk about tornadic activity, high wind events in the form of derechos, microbursts, uh, things of that nature um, as it relates to um, wind, wind events, uh, or excuse me, for the flooding. We'll talk about tornadoes, uh, threats of lightning, and then that of uh, potential flooding and what that would look like here locally, and heat waves. So climate change. From the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or we call NASA, have said in undeniable terms, the effects of human caused global warming are happening now, are irreversible on the time scale of people alive today and will worsen in the, in the decades to come. For those trends that we refer to, and hopefully the people here can at least see this. So this over here marks the 800,000 uh, 800, years back uh, this line right here, this marked demark or this uh, inclination here, is 1950, and then this is our current level to present. You can see everything up to 1950 is correlative to the natural climate change. So we can rule out, based on over the last 800,000 years to now, our CO2 emissions in particular have skyrocketed. And we talk a little bit about some of the initiatives, which we'll cover here, what we've done, tried doing locally, uh, some of the things that we can do also locally to help try to curb that. Uh, we're gonna focus primarily though, for this discussion on the hazards, how we can respond and what we can do to prepare. So how this impacts you. Disasters do not discriminate. Sometimes I think we get into this mindset, well, I have, financially I'm well off or I have a nice home doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to be impacted by a disaster. In fact, you might just stand the chance to have more to lose because you have more that can be lost. Also, we think about infrastructure. I think we've seen on numerous times here in the recent past, power outages. Power outages, uh, as well as our water plant, they're critical infrastructure. Power outages in particular, as of August of just last year, 2021, August 10th, we ended up having over 6,000 without power. During that time, some people were without power for four days. I'd received phone calls to my office directly for people who've lost all their food in their fridge and they didn't have the backup. So it can happen here just even for a small event. Demographics, I know we sometimes when we think about vulnerability, we think about demographics. One thing I would challenge people here to think about is we talk about poverty, for instance, or racial demographics, or whatever the case might be, lack of education, all those things come into play. But when we start thinking about demographics, we have to look a little bit more about what constitutes vulnerability. For instance, we have poverty levels. So poverty levels, there's a certain threshold for a dollar amount that you make. There's also this thing called deep poverty. So in Evanston, I think a lot of people believe that if you're an Evanstonian, you're wealthy. Obviously that's not necessarily the case. 
for our poverty level in general, we tend to be a little bit less than the national average. But when we start talking about deep poverty, which is half the income threshold, we actually have a higher than national average. Also, when we talk about poverty, we haven't really covered the people that have been impacted by COVID. A lot of people are still without jobs. If you looked at year over year analysis, our per capita income went from about 70,000 to more or less 50,000 in one year. A lot of times we think about people living paycheck to paycheck. About 64% of the US on average lives paycheck to paycheck. And surprisingly, the people that are over 100,000 in income 48% of those pop that population is also paycheck to paycheck. So sometimes you could say, well, maybe we were living beyond our means. Misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, there's, there's lots of incorrect information up there. Sometimes it's with intent. People have agendas and they'll per perpetuate it. I would just ask, there's a, a whole initiative here. When you start looking at your social media sources, when you start looking at your news sources, if you wanna get data, I would implore you to consider checking the source and making sure it's credible. If we have a disaster here locally, you'll want to go to the city officials, Evanston Fire Department's Facebook, Twitter page, our gov delivery system for the city. We're dealing and managing with that hazard directly. So we're gonna have the most timely up-to-date information. Logistics. We have a limitation in resources. This is a picture, I believe, from Joplin, Missouri, tornado. The reality is we only have so many people on shift to be able to manage the everyday need. And oftentimes we're calling in additional resources from outside of town just to help manage the everyday. We had something like this. And if it's going to be to this extent, likely there'll be other communities impacted. So our big plan is to rely on outside agencies to help us manage a local event. But if it's a widespread large scale event, and I'm sure the American Red Cross has seen this time and again, a lot of those people aren't coming because they have their own needs. So within the first 30 to 60 minutes, we're gonna be very limited. And we have a population residential more or less about 80,000. Then you have your daytime population, which could be well over 150,000 to 200,000. We even had a quarter of the community impacted. If you do the math, 50,000, we only have several hundred people that maybe would be, be able to respond within a short period of time. Reality is you're gonna be the first responder. The people in this room right now will be the first responder. So this seminar is for you because we need for you to understand our limitations and we also need to know that you understand where we're at so that you can be better prepared. The strategic plan, which was a document developed by FEMA, a five-year plan was put forth by Brock Long, who was the administrator at the time, has three strategic goals. The first strategic goal is building a culture of preparedness. This is what we're doing today. We're starting to lay the foundation. The one thing I would say is that when we start talking about preparedness, it can be built into three basic concepts. We always try to break things down to three because it's probably easy to remember, uh, but there's a lot that's involved with it, but it's very accessible. And you don't have to have a lot of money to do any one of these things. Education, that's where Katie Jacobs comes in. That's where the people in the Evanston Public Library come in, the fire department, the police department. There's a million programs out there that can help provide education on a daily basis. So knowing what those risks are, we're going to cover the four major ones. That's not to say that those are the only things that could happen locally, but being able to incorporate and, and change the mindsets. I think sometimes people think preparedness is, you know, something that may or may not ever happen. So why make the investment? I'm, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Why would I take the extra time out? But preparedness is really an everyday thing. We do it and probably don't even realize what we're doing. And sometimes preparedness seems very scary and inaccessible. But the reality is, if I go out of the house, if I can give an example, if I have my cell phone, communications are vital. If anything happens, I want to be able to communicate. If anybody's who here's lost cell service or their phones died on them. I mean, you can see. So you can also see that there's vulnerability there. So you're going to want to make sure you have a charger and maybe even a backup charger. So maybe one or two systems in place. So I might have a car charger with a a cord, but then I, I, I need that adapter in case I'm inside of a building or something happens. 
you can say, well, I'm going to go out and I might want to get something to eat. So you're going to have cash or a credit card or maybe both. So just having that plan, understanding where the exits are, understanding if something happens, what do I need to do to stay safe? And that's some of what we'll cover today. Preparedness, making a plan. We're going to talk a great deal about start, first starting with yourself. There's the self, we figure if you could manage yourself, then by extension, you're going to help protect your family. And hopefully, if you've got that underway, you'll be able to better protect your community, those neighbors around you, your pets. That's like family for many of us. And we also have other vulnerable populations, neighbors. And that's something you're going to see here in some of these disasters that we talk about, vulnerability and why we really need to pull together and reach outside of just our comfort zone to help people. Because in fact, you may be the person that saves their life. Having a backup plan and then being ready to act. So there's training that's available. We have several CERT members that are here. I'm happy to see. And we talk about what's called the Community Emergency Response Team. This is an opportunity for people to be able to practice the things that we talk about here. It might seem like using an extinguisher, pull, aim, squeeze, squeeze might be easy enough, but when you actually are called to task, it might not be as easy as you think. And we've actually had some CERT members who've come through our training who have actually said, wow, that was, there was a little bit more to that than I even realized. But having that, that skill level, those, that, those opportunities in place to be able to grow and have those skills, having the belief in yourself that you can actually perform is fundamental to being prepared, being able to act, helping others if you're able to, again, understanding those, making those connections with people in the community. Uh, I'm going to show an example up here uh, for high heat that will really bring this into focus. And then how to respond to the hazards. So we're going to start with our heat. What causes heat waves? We talked about the carbon dioxide, the emissions. What that does is creates basically in very simplistic high level terms, a shelf over, over the world. And that traps heat. It prevents the heat from releasing. So the heat builds up. And as we have more and more carbon dioxide emissions and fossil fuels, that just further potentiates that issue. And as you had seen in the graph, that's a growing issue, exponential. All the hazards here also are something that's happened very, very close to us. So high heat. In 1995, who here remembers in July? Um, I think everybody's been around 1995. So um, I have to check myself sometimes. So July 12th to 16th. So everybody, for the most part here, this was horrific. And Chicago had even said that this was one of the most preventable disasters on record in recent history. 739 people died. 106 degree temps during the day, 70, 80 at night. So not a lot of relief. Most of the people that suffered in this crisis were elderly. They were worried about coming out of their homes. They had nailed their windows shut. They were worried about crime. They didn't have the connections, the social connections. And as a result, they cooked in their apartments. So those who do not learn from their mistakes are condemned to repeat it. We have incident after incident that we can learn from. Now we just have to learn from those situations and do what we can to make things better here. And we can start with you. Fatalities. So there's a lot of data out there. Lightning, for instance, there's a lot more on record of records since 1940 of people dying from lightning strikes. But if we were to look here, if you can see this middle column, this is going to be heat, this general center area here. This yellow bar, if you can't see in the back there, is a 30 year average. So on average, every year, we have 143, uh, over a 30 year average, 143 people die because of heat related incidents. This blue bar, 107 over the last 10 years on average have died, still making it on average worse than any other potential hazard listed down here. 
and uh, this red bar is just 51 uh, for 2020. So we actually, I guess, comparatively speaking, we had a better year, but it's still not great. And a lot of times, a lot of this can be avoided just with education. And I would just say here, this lightning right here, this used to be in the 300s, 330 plus, but it's because of education that's really brought that number down. So the, the education works. Being able to empower people to make the right choices works. We just have to take that knowledge and pass it on. The high heat, a uh, couple of guidelines. So we talk about before, certainly having a plan. We're gonna talk a lot about plans. There's a whole lot to know about plans or any of these disasters. So just keep in mind when we give you the recommendations of what to do before, during and after, realize that they're very high level. There's a ton of information out there. We're just gonna hit some of the most prominent issues that we've noticed. And the information you provided, believed through, Katie will provide you by links online for those that are virtual, or if you need, if you can't print it out or access it, you can also pick up a copy at the library. We should have, a, for as long as they last, uh, some copies available. And we also have plans here. We have plans spelled out for communication plans, having a plan relative to heat waves is being able to understand what those where those places of shelter are. If you don't have air conditioning, you wanna be able to have a plan when it gets really hot out. Especially when you're on those upper level floors, it can get pretty toasty. Education is a big thing, heat advisory. Heat index, you hear about that term quite a bit, is the heat plus the humidity. And as we all know, when it's humid out there, it feels a whole lot hotter. And that could potentially do more damage. So that's why it's important to look at that. And one of the most important parts here outside of having the foundation is the local weather forecasting. Local weather forecasting, we have no communications that Mario is going to discuss in detail. There's the National Weather Service, that is your local media sources, our Evanston Fire Department Facebook and Twitter pages. We have gov delivery systems and so forth. There's a ton of information out there, your local news channels. All of that will provide information relative to these hazards. During staying hydrated, the one thing we really want to make sure of, if you can do an electrolyte replacement, like a, I'm not trying to advertise any particular drink, but there's several of them out there. Making sure that you're drinking even before you're thirsty. Thirsty uh, is, uh, we have an expert here in the front, not that he's always thirsty, but he knows enough about medicine to be able to tell you. A lot of times when you're thirsty, it's a little too late. You're already getting dehydrated. So you want to make sure you start drinking even more than usual just to stay ahead of it. Now we're leaving elderly, children, disabled, or pets in an unauthorized vehicle. It's crazy how hot. Turn off the car, sit there just for a minute, a two minutes, and you'll be able to see exactly how traumatic that can be. And we've seen time and again, death can occur within minutes in certain conditions, especially for more vulnerable populations. I think there are apps out there that remind you that your kids can your car. So there's ways to work around it. Twice a day, visit or call older adults with chronic conditions, make sure that they're hydrated, make sure they're cool, make sure that they have a place to go. Disabled populations, elderly populations, excuse me, a lot of times there might be mobility issues. So there might be a little bit more planning that's involved with that. Knowing where your cooling shelters are, where your warming shelters are, and obviously the other types of conditions, but cooling shelters in this case, this, Branch is one of the cooling shelters. We have a number of shelters online. There's information specific in our packets about all the cooling shelters that we have locally, public buildings, any place with air conditioning, getting out of the heat. Remaining in air conditioning, trying not to go outside midday. Definitely don't exercise in the middle of the day if you can avoid during a heat wave. That's, we're asking for it. Cooling centers, again, family and friends is another option. And then when we talk about the signs, when if you are to overcome, be overcome by heat, there's two different conditions that you'll have to think about, heat exhaustion versus heat stroke. Heat exhaustion, we have to think about you're faint and dizzy. These are some of the signs here. You're profusely sweating. Cool, pale, clammy skin, nausea, vomiting, rapid and weak pulse, or muscle cramps. The treatment is to move to a cooler location drinking water, uh, what we call passive cooling, which is taking off 
um, any extra extra clothing, being able to take a cool shower, use cold compresses. Not life threatening, but certainly something that could be life threatening if it left it's left unchecked. Heat stroke. This is a thing. You have the cherry red skin. If you're not sweating, you become disoriented. Rapid, strong pulse, may lose consciousness. These are the times where you really want to make sure that you enact medical care well before you get to this stage. Quite honestly, if you even think you're not feeling well, remove yourself from whatever you're doing. If at all possible, seek shelter, cool your core, meaning your center of your body. Medical treatment is the way to navigate and manage this condition. Keeping cool until treatment. Next hazard, tornadoes. We're gonna to talk about frequency. Everything I can just tell you is on the upswing. So when we talked about that climate change, all of that condition with that anthropogenic activity is causing an increase in those hazards we talked about. Wind events, heat, and all wind events, heat related incidents, the tornadoes, or excuse me, the uh, thunderstorms and the, the flooding. So for tornadoes, since 1950, there's definitely been an, uh, an uptick. I'll show you a graphic here in a second. We, we sometimes think, well, there's just a season for tornadoes. And then after that, we don't have to worry. That's not the case. It's basically all the time now. More prominent during the summer months, but certainly it can happen any time of the year. 3 to 7 p.m., so afternoon to early evening is the time that you can most expect it, at least statistically speaking. Everyone is vulnerable especially in this particular incident. And March to August tends to be that time frame where it's most deadly. That's the graphic you can see here. This is about 2019, starting from 20, uh, 1950. Before, obviously having a plan, this is a big one. You have to really understand where is a safe place to be. Sheltering, that's gonna be explored by Mario. He's the expert when it comes to all things codes, all things evacuation. So he's gonna be able to tell us all about that. And the really important thing here, authority. When somebody tells you, if you get notifications, there's gonna be, what you're gonna hear is either tornado watch or tornado warning. The difference, a warning is when the tornado is upon us, we have to move immediately. A watch is when there's a possibility of it. This watch, you're gonna have to really enact, if I have to take shelter, where do I have to go? Where's a safe place to go? Certainly places away from windows, inside of a structure that is brick, if possible, something that is not outside, if possible. If you, if you can get inside, that's certainly the place to go. Lower the level, if possible, if there's a basement. Inside, maybe in a bathroom or someplace that doesn't have windows, if there's not a basement. NOAA is one of the communications. There is a radio out there that we're gonna talk about. And we're actually giving one away today to the lucky person who would like one. One NOAA radio, but we'll talk about National Weather Service. There's communications between National Weather Service and NOAA that you'll be able to get on those radios. And that is something that can be a lifesaver. It probably saves countless lives. And local news reporting. So before of an incident, you know that you're having, there's a chance for high wind events and it's not looking to be a good day. You wanna make sure you stay really connected and monitor these sources. If at any point in time, the sirens go off, there's a limitation in the sirens. Sirens are meant for people basically outside. So sometimes if you're inside of a building, you're not gonna be able to hear those sirens, but if you're outside, it's meant to seek shelter. That's kind of the rationale behind that. But when a siren goes off, you don't really know what you have to do to stay safe. So that's kind of a limitation. So we need to be able to make sure we can follow that up with what we're calling Evanston Alerts, also called Everbridge. That is an opportunity for me as an emergency manager or several people in town to be able to contact you directly with a text, an email, voice text, however you'd like to receive your message to tell you exactly what's going on, what you have to do to stay safe. Those are critical. And 
would absolutely be seen as lifelines throughout an actual event. So make sure today before you leave, if you're not already signed up for this, please sign up for this. If you're not online signed up for this, you can call your 311 or go to our Evanston Fire Department webpage, pull up emergency notification or Evanston alerts and it should come up. 311 is super easy or 311 if you live locally. And last but not least, we're going to follow this up with Mario, who's going to talk about evacuation. Thank you, Chief Cole. Um, uh, let me finish this one sentence. Okay. So, uh, just a couple of things. We're going to take a short break in a minute, uh, but I want to just touch base on something that Chief Cole mentioned. First of all, for those of you that are joining us virtually, uh, we have these packets here available at the library. Uh, we will leave extra ones here. So if you don't get one, you want one of these, there's a lot of information in here of everything we're talking about, about the specific tornadoes. A uh, lot of very useful information available for you. Again, if you're not here to get us here today. In the fire service, I just, as I was sitting here listening to Chief Cole's presentation, uh, we have something called incident command. Um, and the important thing about incident command is that if we have an incident here in our city and we are calling for other uh, departments to come in and help, uh, another name for it is also you call it unified command, uh, we want to have the same uh, plain talk communication. Uh, I grew up in the 70s with the CBs and we had the 10 commands. Anybody remember the 10s? 10 2, 10 4, 10 9, okay? Uh, in the police department, one time you see is 10 commands. But guess what? If you don't know the 10 commands, then you have no idea what the person's talking about. In the fire service and municipal, it's not just police and fire, but it's our whole city. We have worked on these plain talk text commands so that whoever comes in, we're all talking the same language. So when we're talking about preparation, the key word that we're talking about today is preparation knowledge. When we're talking about training, what we want to do is we want you to participate in training so that you understand our CERT people that we talk, when we talk a little bit about what CERT does, we teach them all to work together. Uh, if they're doing a search and rescue, if they're doing fire extinguisher training, we have a procedure to do a two person fire extinguisher training, going in, backing out, you're protecting yourself, you're working as a team. You're gonna work your site, you're, you're, again, the three point command, you're gonna take care of yourself first. But then second, you take care of your family and then your community. You need to make sure that you all understand what you're doing, okay? If just a simple thing we talked about, a tornado watch and warning, when it's happening is not the time to be trying to figure out which is which, okay? We want to be trained and repeat training. It's like, this is the watch and this is the warning, okay? And if you learn it, that's great, but if a family nurse learns it, then you're working together, okay? So all this stuff we're going to be talking about today is the importance of training together, uh, having that understanding that we all can, you know, it's like if you forget something, uh, maybe somebody else will remember. When we get to the kits, we'll be talking about what do you want to have in a kit? Uh, somebody may have more um, items on their kit because there might be an individual and they're thinking of as an individual. So another person may have a family, so not they're only thinking about themselves, but they're talk, thinking about their children. So the kit is designed individually for the, uh, for the the person itself. But again, uh, some people lean stronger towards one thing or the other. You may, you may have everything kit and you forget something else, but as a, as a team, somebody else may be taking care of that for you. So to, to get together, we'll, we'll have what we need for each other. Um, last week, we could take just like a five minute break to just stretch a little bit, come back. There is something to drink here, and then we'll get started on tornadoes. We've got a little bit more to cover today, okay? Well, actually, 
Okay, guys, we're gonna get started. Again, kind of repeating some of the stuff we're we're, uh, we're talking about, uh, just to uh, again let you know. Um, as we talk about this stuff, guys, is sometimes we have to be told more than once or twice. Okay, you know, we, we hear that we hear this stuff, and then, then we either kind of forget about it or or whatever. So, cheap cool uh, end of our presentation meant that if you are in a location and you hear the sirens go off, okay, um, which 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 one is it? Which is the watch? Which is a warning? Okay, uh, so so you got to be thinking about those. Ideally, you want to get into a safe place. Right now, for where we're sitting, you know, we have windows against our wall here. Would this be a good place to be? Maybe because of windows, no, right? But let's let's say we're up at a high right building. Evanston has a lot of high right buildings. So now you're going to try and get into the stairwell, go down the stairs to try the base or whatever. You may not have the time, okay? So again, a lot of the stuff that we talk about is there. These are some of the steps you have to do, but some of this you have to be get creative, okay? So yes, should, uh, if you're at the top floor, should you get to the bottom? No problem. If you're in your house, yes. Can you get to basement? Yes. I don't have a basement. How can I get to a basement? I don't have one. Okay, we'll get to an interior space where there's no windows, uh, safe, you know, uh, no, no large spans. Hallways are really good, bathrooms and such, okay? One of the things that I always talk about uh, when we do evacuation in schools is what's above us, okay? We've had it where we put all these kids uh, in this hallway, but we don't realize that all our air handling units are directly above us. So it's not only, you know, this is a safe area, but we don't want something that's going to be bouncing up there and all of a sudden they come crashing down. You know, if you have time, get down as far as you can. Okay. If you don't have time, it's all of a sudden, you know, here's a tornado as, as you know, you have a, a tree shooting down Davis Street. Uh, maybe you just get in the hallway and that's where you're going to be. Okay. You have to have that head coverage because not only, you know, the winds and everything else, but stuff is shaking and stuff can come crashing down uh, in your homes or whatever. So you try to cover your head and be careful. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, if you have warning movement places, there's no place outside safe from tornadoes. Uh, we, we don't have all the time, but you can have, there's pages and pages, there's some information on the sheet. What if you're traveling? Okay. Uh, do you stay in the car? You try and race the tornado, which is not a good advice. There's a lot of information out there on this stuff. We're kind of just talking about for us a little stuff. So, uh, seek shelter away from windows, lowest level in the home, take cover. No alert radios. Uh, we talked about this last time. Uh, these are called the NOAA Na uh, National Oceanic. I'm going to mess it up. Something administration. I know I'm going to do it. Uh, these are radios are very inexpensive. Sorry, I keep I keep going the wrong place here. Um, you, you can pick these up. Very inexpensive. We are going to hand, get, get one of these away today. Uh, basically, it just sits in your home. This is a battery on it, battery backup, where you can plug it in. And you can have it where it's either you're going to send a text so it doesn't disturb you, or it's going to tone, or it's going to go off if there's an alert. NOAA has over a thousand uh, sites all over the United States. Uh, there's seven frequencies, so you just program this to the closest frequency. If I did this right. Saturday, southwest wind 5 to 10 knots becoming west. Areas of fog. So you can simply push it, and, and uh, it gives you the continuous information weather report or again uh this is set up is that if there is an uh, alert that goes off this thing will go off you know here's some tones and let you know that there's some severe weathers in the area so those are good again the city has a lot of other programs are everbridge if you haven't signed up everbridge sign up for that um and again listen to your local news and we're going to give you the, the, the earliest most direct information possible okay um one of the things is after Quite often people, it's like, oh, the storm passed by, I'm gonna go out and look, look, and I've seen it firsthand, where now I have kids riding their bikes, and we're gonna be talking about flooding a little bit, uh, in floodwaters, or people walking the sidewalks and looking, oh, whatever. You've got tree branches that may be uh, ready to come down. Uh, you have, you could possibly have down power lines, so you gotta be extremely careful when you go outside. There could be debris, and your beautiful day today, there's a lot of people walking around in sandals today, okay? So all of a sudden you got some parts of roof that came down and now you step on a nail, okay? So you gotta be extremely, extremely careful when you go outside. Listen to the radio, you know, could just cause the storm passed by, could sometimes all of a sudden it comes around and here it comes again, yes. So you gotta be, be aware of that. So assess all the hazards. If you're trapped, um, one of the things that's kind of surprising is we don't want you yelling for help. 
Does anybody remember the, the movie? I, I loved movies, uh, Titanic, okay? Titanic, what was, uh, uh, what was the, the lady's name? Uh, <coughs> Rose, Rose, okay? <coughs> Rose, help, help, help. She couldn't, she, she basically got hoarse. She couldn't hear it, right? What saved Rose? The whistle, right? Hit the whistle. So, so you know, you, you want to find something to bang, you want to have a whistle, you know, you can, you can scream and scream, but if there's a lot of noise going on, you may not be heard and you scream so long, you may get hoarse and, and it's more wear on your body. So banging on stuff, making whistles or something that's gonna make, some, make it easier on you. So, so call, you know, it says whistle, text, social media, uh, if it's working, the text and social media, it may not be working, okay? Uh, response for power outage. When we have these storms, we have power outages. Uh, so again, preparation. Does anybody have a generator at home? Excellent, two generators. Uh, where do I have my mind, my mind goes back, go back, where did it come from? Never mind. I, I have two generators at home is what I was gonna say. I got, I got two generators, I, I believe in generators. There's a lot of portable power supplies that you can buy for your phones. Uh, we have a CERT member that has a, a solar charging unit for her phone. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, things that are available out there for you in the market that can help you. Uh, if you have medical, uh, Chief Cool was talking about if we have medical needs that you may have, uh, do you have any kind of battery backups for that stuff? Or, you, you know, your provider, service provider, find out, you know, if I have a power outage, how I'm going to take care of this equipment that I need, okay? Or even it could be refrigeration on some medicine supplies. This is that preparation we talk about. Um, uh, alternate plans for refrigerating, medicines and such. Um, and if it's safe to go, uh, alternate location for location or cook, you know, cooking. Again, folks, if you're listening, what like we're asking you to do, and the municipality is telling you to stay put, we want you to stay put. If we are telling you to move where you need to move, you know, oh yeah, there's this hurricane, but I want to sit here, this is my home and all that. It's like, move, <laughs> you know. Conventional wisdom is telling you, you better move because if something happens, we're not coming look getting you because we're, we're already busy or tied down or we're hiding from the storm, okay? So if you have time, we're telling you, now since I move, please move, go, okay? Or if you're gonna stay, you're, you've got your food, you got all equipment, okay. And then uh, again, if possible, check in on neighbors. Again, we're here to help each other out. So are you prepared for power outages? We have flashlights here. You get a flashlight tonight while you're here. Uh, we have flashlights in our phones. But again, some of this has time duration. So be careful on how much you use this thing. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, I'm gonna talk about real quick about this table here that we have is our emergency kit. Uh, you can go on the internet. Uh, there's a, in your packet, there's an organization called ready.gov. Ready.gov um, has these emergency kits, gives you ideas on what to do. Uh, so does the Red Cross. I was thinking of Hank. Hank, I couldn't you, think of your name for a few seconds there. Okay. But Red Cross has, you go on, online internet and they give you ideas how to do that. The problem being with a ready-made kit, you can go online and you can purchase a bucket with all the stuff that you want. The one thing I personally don't like is some of the food products that they offer, I don't care for. Okay. So some of the stuff is good. Some of it isn't. It's up to you. I personally like to look at the checklist that are, is being provided from ready.gov or Red Cross. I look and they talk about food supplies. What do I need? Currently, um, I'm sorry, previously, the recommendation is that you needed one, uh, two to three days worth of food supply per person. The latest trend is they want you to have two to three weeks. Now I have two to three weeks, a family of four. Okay, let's say you pick a family of four and you have three weeks of food supply, we're not asking you to go out today to the grocery store and buy four weeks of food supply for a family four, okay? But we are saying is, as Chief Cool was mentioning earlier, as you're doing this preparation, every time to the grocery store, you know, if you buy a can of a product, okay, buy one can, buy a second can, and this can is gonna go in your emergency supply kit. Uh, any kind of supplies, your water supplies and such. A lot of people have a lot of water in there. I will tell you, I, in my home, I have water supply, but I do not have five gallon that you can get containers of water. Why? Because I don't want to be messing around with five gallons of water. It's over 40 pounds. I have gallons and I have bottles of water. 
okay? I have enough for myself and my family. So, so again, as you're going through this on this preparation, you know, take a look at some of this. And what we would say, ask you, suggest is pick one item at a time, okay? And take a look at it. Do I have sufficient lighting? Okay, I got one flashlight, two flashlights, three flashlights, whatever. Do I have it in my home? Do I have it in my car? Um, battery, you know, solar power's charging stuff, water supply, you know, maybe, you know, once a week, maybe when I go grocery shopping or once a month, I'm gonna start building up my water supply. Over time, you will have what you need, guys. Okay, and back to Chief. Thank you, guys. Again, after the presentation's over, we'll be more than happy to answer questions. If we have time, we'll answer them while we're being televised. And if there's any questions after, I know we're covering a lot of information. That is one of the takeaways we had had from the first seminar that we had. You can certainly contact myself, Kimberly Cool. Office of Emergency Management. Also, there's a chat bar for those that are online. We'll try to answer those questions and respond back if you could provide an email. So for thunderstorms, we've experienced a number of these. These obviously can develop into the tornadoes that we talked about. They can develop into flooding. They can have hazards like lightning. Before the storm, just a basic overview, high level overview, shelter in a substantial building certainly because they can progress into something other than just a thunderstorm. Sometimes the winds associated with thunderstorms are pretty significant. Lightning. If you hear thunder, the rule of thumb is if you hear thunder, get indoors because if you hear thunder, there's a chance for lightning. People think sometimes if they don't see it or if they haven't heard the, uh, seen the rain come down that for some reason that they're in some way protected, but there have been several fatalities related to conditions where you might hear thunder, people are outside and they are struck. And uh, closing doors, but during the storm, avoiding the electrical equipment. One of the things that we sometimes think about when we have thunderstorms is that you can have power surges. Sometimes it happens. Based on the winds, we've had several outages. I think probably everybody in this room, if you've been in Evanston or any other place, if you have high wind activity, outages can occur. <clears throat> be wary, beware of flooding. People that are in certain <clears throat> lower lying areas may have water collected. Some people along the lakefront might be a little bit more vulnerable to wind surge and potential lakefront flooding. Then there's also after the storm, the recommendation on average is stay inside 30 minutes after. That gives you enough time for any potential threat of thunder and lightning, uh, more specifically, to occur. And assess for the hazards. As soon as you come out, be cognizant of the fact that there's potential threats. Uh, one in particular we'll talk about and that may have already been covered is the down line. Lines, you can never know if it's just assume that it's alive. It might not be sparking. It might just be laying there looking innocent. And it could be fully charged. So steer clear of it. Recommendation is 100 feet. Again, we talked about the flood warning and the flood watch. NOAA, that weather radio that we talked about, National Weather Service, news reports, certainly Evanston alerts through the Everbridge system that we talked about, personalized messages that go right to your phone, email, however you set it up. Any of the notifications here, you'll see. There's one thing also, for severe activity that I'm not sure we really addressed is VIA, which I don't think we've covered yet. I believe it was a couple of years back, we were in a CERT class and everyone's phone went off and it was a WIA message. WIA is called Wireless Emergency Alerts. That is the county or the state and some municipalities have authority to be able to through the cell towers, activate any cell phone within radius of that cell tower. And you don't have to be subscribed to it. And oftentimes you hear everybody's phone blowing up at once. And that's what they call as WIA. National Weather Service is that service that puts out weather notifications, especially if it's imminent. So again, if those go out, they're only sending them out unless you absolutely need that information. Heed their warnings. Also, um, there's a difference in the flooding. So we talk about lakefront 
So we've seen plenty of that. January 10th and 11th, we had a disaster declaration locally. That was of 2020. There was a substantial amount of lakefront flooding, of several hundred thousand uh, in immediate damages with uh, the potential between uh, damages and mitigation efforts up to almost 5 million estimates states. And there's the lakefront flooding that we're familiar with, but there's also this thing called surface flooding when we have the torrential pours. And we've probably already seen that as well when the, the sewer system cannot take in all the water that's being dropped and it floods the streets. And that's where you're going to have some of these flood warnings. So a flood warning in particular is when the flood is happening or will happen soon and the floods will be, the roads will be flooded. Certainly moving to higher ground immediately and never driving through flooded roads. So warning, take action is a, war, a warning is take action and a watch is enacting that plan. Mario brought up a great point. If you have either a warning or a watch, it's probably good to get in place as opposed to waiting. And oftentimes when something happens, you're going to probably be scratching your head thinking, well, was that a warning? Is that the one I have to actually do something? Just assume that you probably should enact, get into place and be ready in case it does progress because it can happen rather quickly. One other thing too that we may not know is six inches, just six inches of water, if you walk out you try to avoid flood waters, but six inches of moving water can take you off your feet. And as many as 12 inches, just a foot of water, which isn't that much, can actually move a car. So flood waters are pretty dangerous. Steer clear of it. Not to mention they can get pretty gross because they can have contaminants. Sewage, so forth. Flood insurance. That is something I cannot underscore. And I think the American Red Cross will be able to give a little bit more information in terms of why it's so important. You might have insurance. You have your own home. You still have a mortgage, you have to have insurance, but that insurance might not necessarily provide you that flood protection that you think. Also, when we talk about flooding, we think about, well, we're, what are our hazards? There's this thing called flood mapping from FEMA. There are estimates that that is not keeping up with the trends, meaning we might be in a flood zone and it might not necessarily be indicated by the FEMA flood mapping because the climatological changes are happening so quickly, we're outrunning our current mapping model. So realize anybody can be subject to flooding in, in one way or another. So make sure you have insurance. During the flood, flood waters again, avoid any flood waters if at all possible. Physical threat, certainly from being swept away and then the contaminant. But you can also have lines that are energizing that water supply as well that you might not even be able to see. So just avoid them altogether. Driving conditions. This is a pretty telling picture in the back here for these for people with their cars. And you have this gentleman with a boat. It might come quicker than you even realize. You might think you might be able to make it. You might not even know how deep it is. Just steer clear of them. Uh, understanding where the threats are and trying to avoid those threats. I'm not saying go out and get a boat. I'm just saying get your flood insurance and not understand where, what area you live in. Driving considerations, again, avoiding that and then avoiding storm damaged areas. So when you come back out after a thunderstorm or if there is flooding, make sure you proceed with caution and evacuation. If there is any indication for any reason that it, we are recommended to evacuate, do not second guess. I would just implore you that maybe your risk perception states, well, that's never happened. That can't happen to me. We've never had a tornado. We've never had whatever particular event you're coming across. If the experts are saying you need to evacuate, that has been heavily weighed and your life safety has been made a priority. So I would beg of you to heed any warnings, especially as it relates to evacuation or anything related to life safety, if it's being provided to you from a government governmental entity, local government, state government, so forth. After the flood, again, the electro, electrical hazards, we talked about the 100 foot minimum. Lots on average in Chicago, I think are 25 wide. So it's about four houses. Listening to authorities and again, avoiding unless absolutely necessary life safety. Post-disaster, do's and don'ts, try to stay calm. 
one of the things you can do, take a deep breath. Sometimes just taking that extra step really helps. If you move, you're reactive, you're not thinking about what you're doing, you could probably hurt yourself, put yourself in a worse condition than you were before. Assessing for injury, your, your own personal injury, those in your family, and then as you, if everybody's okay, you don't have to provide any bandaging or anything like that after an actual event, know that you'll have to then assess for particular hazards like this right here. You have down trees, you can have lines. You can see this right here, it's maybe hard in the back row, but this is the line, just assume that it's energized. And well being checks. So we talked a little bit about that. I cannot stress that enough. Again, your, yourself, your family, uh, those around you, being aware of people in your community, having those relationships in advance. Because the one thing that we have seen time and again is during a disaster, if you don't know the person, it's a little bit harder to get them to come with you or to do something because there's also threats of scams and people, you know, not being above board or having ulterior motives. And so if you have those trust, that trust in people around you, they're more likely to be more compliant, heed your direction, and be wanting to be helped. Pets, certainly securing your pets, lots of lost pets. And if you do know, if you had to relocate, making sure that the plan that you have accommodates the pets that you have, if you have a disability, understanding what places, transportation you would need to be able to get from point A to point B, what locations, what your needs are, having all that mapped out in that plan would be very helpful. Don'ts, obviously avoid the power lines, avoid driving through flooded waters, contaminated water, sometimes in the tap itself, and you could have a fractured line and not even know it. Don't even trust the water supply if it was a major event like a tornado. I would talk about maybe using that water jug that you might have put to the side. You can get those probably for as little as $1.50 these days. So it's very affordable. Uh, and for power outages, do not use an elevator. So if you're gonna be inside, general considerations are take the stairs. Calling down lines, down power lines, you can call 911. If your power is out, you can call comment. Downline means potential threat to life safety. An outage is different. 1-800-EDISON-1 is the number or this number that's on the display here. 311, you can contact for limbs down. If it's blocking major roadways, if it's a main arterial like a central street or a ridge, you probably call 911 because that would potentially impact our ability to respond. And just use your judgment. You are not alone. So we're gonna hear from our American Red Cross, Brian Nessler, Sarah, Sarah Davis. <laughs> it was not a plan for me to be here. That's why I should be here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so obviously we talked a lot about, you know, things you can do, um, obviously ways you could be aware of things, but unfortunately things do happen. Um, We've actually had a couple different responses here in Evanston, uh, mostly surrounding fires, but obviously we respond to all different sorts of hazards. So a little bit about what we do, you know, with the Red Cross, and by the way, we've got all sorts of different organizations that might be here assisting. There'll be plenty of others too, unfortunately, if there, there is a, a major event. But one of the first things we do is we're probably gonna come in and immediately talk about sheltering needs, things like that. Um, we have established shelters here before, um, like I said, for, for various events like, like fire-related uh, events right now. But we do that for all sorts of different things. As a matter of fact, we talked about tornadoes earlier. Last summer, uh, we were all actually, Hank, Sarah, and myself were all involved when the uh, Woodridge uh, Naperville uh, tornado happened last year. And, you know, people think that doesn't happen in urban areas. It definitely does. You know, it's, it, this isn't just, you know, out in cornfields and things like that. So... You know, these things do happen. We respond to it. Um, I was there literally within a couple hours of Trineo. Hank was there a few hours after that. Because <laughs> um, Hank always loves when I call him. <laughs> um, but we're gonna do that. And, and actually Hank is our, uh, our our feeding lead for the entire region. So 
Uh, Hank is literally one of the first people I call and say, hey, we got something big going on. Literally the point that Hank answers the phone is like, what's wrong? <laughs> So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be taking care of those immediate needs for you right away. Um, we're gonna be talking through different things. Also, that's where insurance comes into play. And I know Chief also mentioned insurance. Um, it is important to review what your insurance covers, what you can expect, you know, from your insurance when when bad things happen. Um, your regular homeowners or renters insurance is going to cover a lot of things if you're displaced. Your, you know, if you look into flood insurance, and honestly, it's one of those things where. Review those maps that you know that those FEMA maps, but also look around. Look at what those possible hazards could be around your home. We're obviously not too far from the lake, so while it's you know sometimes you do get recurrence of different things like that. If you're you know a, a block in from the lake, you can be affected by those things. If it actually comes down the street or or whatever, flood your basement. You know does things like that. So my advice for the insurance is you know review now when there's nothing going on. Because the problem is, once something happens, obviously you can't change that. So, um, but after that, what we do, we also talk a little about uh, our smoke alarm uh, program. We actually install, we're actually in the middle of our, our national program doing, you know, smoke alarms, different things like that. Um, because here's the thing, if you have a smoke alarm, you have a 50% chance more of getting out of a, your house from a home fire than if you don't. And that's one of the things, you know, we love. I know the fire department loves too. You guys are standing out in front of the, the house when they show up, they get to go attack the fire and, and do what they need to do. They don't have to worry about running in and, and, and get rescuing you. But once we then establish that and get going, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk next about how we actually help you with your recovery. And that's what we do with things called casework. And Sarah's gonna talk about that. Yeah, uh, it'll just be a couple minutes. I just wanna talk about what happens after we show up to mm -hmm. the event, right? Because we don't just show up, throw you in the shelter, give you some food and say bye, right? We <laughs> actually assign each person a caseworker through the Red Cross. And what we do is we walk you through the services that we provide, which we're not going to get into every single one of them today, but the services that we provide from immediate financial assistance to, um, like I said, sheltering, feeding, ongoing support that we can provide. But we also connect you with these type of organizations, as well as many others, to ensure that your needs are met, to make sure that you get through your recovery process in a timely fashion. But I'm going to go back to that insurance thing who was very nice about it. I'm not going to be nice. Flood insurance is not a given on every homeowner's insurance, and it's never a given on renter's insurance. Double check because you're going to lose everything if your home is flooded. And if you don't have insurance, it takes a lot of money to replace those things. Um, secondarily, we have many, many, many instances where people just say, I, I don't need renter's insurance. It's 15 to $25 a month, and it covers everything in your apartment or your home if you're renting. Really and truly look for it, double check everything that you have. And if you can't afford it, there are programs out there that can help cover those things if you ask your insurance company about them. Um, but that was what I'm done with my little soapbox there. So I'm gonna get off of that and I'm gonna send it back to the chief. Yep. Um, we Thanks, are around uh, at the end. So if there's any yeah. questions you have about anything in our process, let us know. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just so you know, I know we talked a lot about the hazards. It probably feels a little overwhelming. This isn't a doom and gloom. What this is is providing you the knowledge so that you know how better to respond to these events ahead of an incident. And being planned, having a plan, having a not only a plan in place, but having those partnerships in place, understanding what resources are available is a big part of the response as well as the recovery. There's the other secure network, which we're all familiar with. Sir, I cannot say enough about our system. They are amazing. And I would also say too, hopefully we'll be able to hear from them. If you're not going to, they can't be part of this based on time. Uh, they are available to maybe share their experiences and what search done for them. But lots of life-saving skills. We talk about CPR, free CPR comes with that. All the basics that you would need to survive and also be able to help those in your family and then by extension, your community. Medical Reserve Corps, that was an integral part of the COVID response with vaccinations. The incident command system, as Mario had mentioned, that's a huge part of what we do and also City of Evans Seven and Services. So our Health and Human Service Department, although there are limitations in terms of the length of services that the American Red Cross offers, 
if you have insurance and you have a plan, our Health and Human Service Department can help provide a little bit longer term assistance, but not an extended stay. It's more if you have a plan in place, they can assist for a week or so. For the incident command system, I can just tell you we are doing a ton every single day on a citywide level to be prepared. Two things here you'll see are emergency response drills. A lot of times we'll talk about tactically how do we manage incidents and if somebody has a material spills, which I believe this particular incident was, or if it's going to be command level structures. That incident command system we talked about is more or less a very strategic structured response that includes people that are the decision makers, more or less, the people that manage the big tasks that need to be done, and then the doers, the people that are actually getting it done. That's the most simplistic terms I can put it. Tons and tons and tons of training. So we are well prepared. Some of the things that have also been done in town that I think are really important to know as it relates to our public works department. David Stoneback could not be here today. David, and the Public Works team have done an amazing job by trying to be proactive, working with our ComEd, talking to them on a daily basis sometimes about potential upgrades that need to be done in towns. So we don't have those opportunities. But also in terms of stormwater management, I guess 20 plus years back, basement flooding was really a huge issue. As I see somebody here shaking their head, yes. So, one of the things that's been done, one of the many things that's been done, $210 million worth of an investment in the last 17 years up and through to 2008 was invested in increasing the infrastructure to be able to help manage the stormwater. Now there's more that needs to be done because remember we talked about that CARP. That CARP is that Community Action Resilient Plan. By 2050, all that flooding is going to start increasing at a logarithmic rate. Also with that wind surge activity and then the heat waves, high wind events, all of that leads to the need for ongoing as well as future studies. So currently as of April of 2020, study was conducted and will be completed by November of this year by Hay and Associates. And they're talking about studying the hydrologic and hydraulic model of the city stormwater system to make sure that we are ready for 2050 and beyond. That's gonna take an amazing amount of money, but it's all worth it because we're trying to protect our residents. Future, again, understanding what the future looks like. These trends are picking up in a rate that we weren't even anticipating, I think a hundred years back, 50 years back. And then now where we're at, we noticed that we need to be ahead of the curve. And mitigation, which is a way to fix something or build a system that is going to be ahead of a disaster is far more effective way to spend money than it is after the fact. And then on a city end for the community action resilience, there's this climate department, a woman named Kara Pratt for um, the climate resilience coordinator. She oversees that initiative. And I am very impressed with what's been able to be done. Since 2005 to 2020, so 15 years, we've been able to decrease our carbon emissions by 35% with the idea, the end goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. Some of the things that have been done, Evanston's been able to achieve 100% renewable energy for city operations just last year. That's a huge initiative, huge. Not to mention the fact there's been update on building codes and that continues to happen. That's what's gonna get us more to that carbon neutrality goal by 2050, supporting energy renewable products and being able to make sure that we're gonna do away with the gas vehicles, move towards electric model, walking, biking, green space, and then planting more trees. So what you can do, we keep talking about it. I feel like we're beating a dead horse, but I cannot say enough, communication is your lifeline. If you don't have your cell phone for a little bit, it might be obvious, but when a disaster happens, when the sirens go off and you don't know what's going on, I think that if there's anything that puts it in perspective, that would, especially if you're caring for children, your family, those loved ones. So again, 
Uh, before you leave, we'll get you set up for this 311, uh, or excuse me, the Evanston alerts. Uh, we can, I can personally sign you up or you can also call 311. Uh, the battery operated no radio and then the there's this in the packet you'll see online as well as in the packets on the table there's a communications list so there's a number of materials available that's just one aspect of the overall plan what you can do understand preparedness is an everyday thing it starts today and if you can make it as easy as possible by just realizing if you do just one thing there's some initiatives out there that you'll be able to see that's also on the table, a calendar. Every month, according to FEMA and ready.gov, there's an initiative. So we talk about, one month we'll talk about fire safety. Another month we'll talk about tornadoes. If you just take five minutes to learn something about what that one topic is, by the end of the year, you'll be better off than you were before. As Mario <coughs> mentioned, if you get a buy one, get one free in a can, it doesn't have to cost anything. It could just be just a give me. You might not need it right now, but you can put it away and then start building that, that kit. It can be very accessible. And because you've been so wonderful to come today, somebody, two people, will be able to get a new emergency preparedness bag, all free of charge, a gift, along with your flashlight, and uh, we'll be giving away one oil radio. So, Again, just by showing up, you're already taking a step towards preparedness. The public library, again, Wi-Fi, free hotspots, serves as a cooling and a warming shelter. As well, I believe there are seven locations in Evanston that are deemed cooling, potential cooling or warming shelters during their hours of operation. Rehearse with your family, your friends, and your neighbors. Once you set your plan, make sure other people know what that plan is so that they can also participate. Again, this is that calendar I referenced. For this plan, uh, we talked about a little bit more about just doing something every day. CERT is a great, if you're going to take a step, we meet once a month and we learn about different topics, sometimes plans, communications. We talked about ham radio. There's lots of different avenues you can take with this. Again, free CPR training is a big part of that. We talk about that's through the community emergency response team. That's that training that I mentioned. Also, Health and Human Services has the Medical Reserve Corps, all free of charge. Training, free training is available. We're working with our faith based organizations, our social service agencies, our disability community. And by extension, we will then be reaching out to our businesses to help talk about preparedness, not just on an individual level or family level, but an organizational level, because oftentimes, we are reliant upon agencies like our social service agencies of which we have over 30 in town. We wanna to make sure that they're prepared and what we wanna understand is not only what their needs are but also their capabilities. And how can we in advance support them? Mario's pretty much already covered this. Talking about a kit, we have plans for our home. We can have plans for our car. We all know what those kits look like. They oftentimes just come in a Nice little kit, but then you can have blankets in case you're stuck on the road and road flares. And there's a number of things. All of that's been available uh, online or in the packets that are provided. There's also important documents. There is a document that I just would like to highlight here. It's called an emergency financial first aid kit. This is probably one of the most comprehensive documents that I've seen put forth by FEMA. And basically, if you fill it out, we all have it printed out. You just have to fill out the document. By collecting the documents that they recommend, filling out, putting your communications plan in, putting all the pertinent information that they ask for, making two copies. You can uh, fill out one, put it online. You can take the other one and put it in a sealable bag. And in doing that, you will be better positioned if a disaster does occur by coming up with your packets. You will literally be in a position where you can be more eligible for individual assistance through the government if you have your documents and all your information available and you can start your recovery effort right now. So that's why that's so important and that cannot be understated. Financial preparedness, again, that talks a lot about that. It talks about how you can make preparedness accessible. Again, going back to that paycheck to paycheck, a lot of people are already in a position where it's hard to make ends meet. But there are plans out there that are also available and I can also provide that 
that talk a lot about being able to cut your food bill in half. So maybe we can just look at how we're spending our money. Sometimes we have these luxuries, like maybe these fancy coffees or some, you know, this little thing here or there. If you maybe just cut out one fancy coffee every single week, you can be in a position where you can gain a lot of traction in terms of savings. And then Mario has a technique where he just takes his change and puts it in a jar. And he does quite well by the end of the year, just by doing something that seems insignificant. It all adds up. Again, insurance, can't state that enough. All very important. Disability considerations. I know we only have a few minutes. There's a couple things that Mario's going to talk about for premise alert program. That's basically, I can, I can cover it. Yeah, so the premise alert program is if you are disabled. So we talk a lot about preparedness, but the one thing that I can't take into consideration is what your personal circumstances are. So it's a very individual process. Sometimes with medicines, medical needs, whatever it is that your situation entails, it's only you that will know exactly what would work best for you, what you couldn't do with, do not do with over a three day period, a week period, a two week period, a three week period. So knowing what that plan is, what you need to have and making that plan to make sure that that's available is huge. So this premise alert program basically says if for some reason, if you're disabled and we respond to your house, there are directions that you can tell dispatch that that tells basically our first responders how to access your home. There's some things we have called the Knox box, which is a metal box that's affixed to a building that we have a special key in our fire department that we can access. Only us in the fire department has that. We don't have to break down your door if we have to get it. We can just use the key. <clears throat> but as Mario said, you can't have your own personal key because then the key ring would be enormous. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's the way to get around that. Emergency preparedness checklist. Again, there's a million tools that are available. There are workshops that we do have that we can also provide help and assistance with. Those will be made available on the city's website through the emergency management site under Evanston Fire Department. And once those become available, I can also send that information out as well as we can take your information to make sure you're on a mailing list. And last but not least, comment. So the only other thing I would mention, if you have a medically dependent device that is reliant on electricity, there's a way to contact ComEd to make sure your, your services are restored and you're seen as more of a critical infrastructure in a sense and you're prioritized in getting those services restored. So just another tool in the toolbox. Again, preparedness is, can be at an organizational level, an individual level, family level or even a block by block level. So once you get proficient on this end, you can then by extension start to, to reach out. And those communities fare very well, those that are connected. So the message by and large is to be prepared, yes. Okay, we got just like a minute left. Okay. Can you mention about the safety seminar that's gonna be coming up in September, in 30 seconds? In September of this year, we're going to have an emergency preparedness fair. It'll be a two day event, a Saturday and a Sunday. There's a question about the dates. Initially, we were 17 and 18. 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Sunday. There'll be lots of giveaways. We are gonna have more than likely at least 40 individuals, organizations that will be in attendance that can talk to you about the services that they provide. There'll be lots of giveaways. There'll be a lot of opportunities to learn a lot more about preparedness. And opportunities also for registration for uh, other events that are coming up. In Robert Crown, that'll, be the Robert Crown. that'll be at the Robert Crown Center. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So again, thank you so much for everybody showing up here today, also online. Very much appreciate your time. And for those, I think most of the people in the room have taken a step or two towards preparedness. I hope that this is a tool in the toolbox. For those online, if you have not, congratulate yourself. Applause. Because you have taken that first step. Thank you. We have a time frame in the library. Yes, it's a very quick thing. Okay, I'm going to just turn around.